Uh, we would like to welcome Professor Carlos Delgado Cruz from the uh, University of Carlos de Madrid, Spain, to give our first uh, keynote of today. Yes, please allow me to introduce him briefly. Uh, Professor Carlos is a uh, Vice President for Strategy and Digital Education of the University of Carlos III de Madrid, Spain. His topic today is MOOC in the AI era. Professor Carlos received his PhD in computer science from I'm sorry if my pronunciation is wrong. Technische Universität München and in telecommunications engineering from Universität Politechnische de Madrid. He is a full professor in telematics engineering at the Universität Carlos III de Madrid, where he is the director of GAST Research Group and director of UNESCO Chair on Scalable Digital Education for All. He has carried out research stays in several universities such as Harvard, MIT, Munich, and Pashu. His main research interests are in educational technology. We listened to him in Germany back two months ago, and we were so impressed by his vision, by his thought, and his experience. So therefore, he is here to share his um, talk with us. Without further delay, please join me to welcome Professor Carlos. Thank you very much. Uh, it's such a great uh, moment to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to all the Thai friends. It's an honor, a pleasure to be here this morning to share a few ideas with you. My, the title of my talk is MOOCs in the AI Era. And basically, this is the summary of the presentation. I will put in context where we are, where I believe we are right now, and what does it mean in comparison to previous moments. Then I will talk about mood production and how the production has been so far and maybe how it will be in the near future. Because this allows us to do things faster, more efficiently. But it also allows us, the new technologies, new AI technologies, to do things differently. Things that were not possible before, like a further personalization and further translations, etc. So this will be the third part of my presentation. So first the context, then to do the same thing before with new technologies, and then finalize with some things which could not, could not be done before easily and can be done uh, right now, or will be in the near future. So the idea of Industry 4.0 is not new to you. <clears throat> Basically that we have gone through several revolutions, the industrial, first industrial revolution of the steam, the second one based on electricity, the third one based on computing, on the internet, and the fourth one on artificial intelligence. And the same idea I want to apply to education. Education 0.0, .0 could be the one before any technology. It's oral communication. So <clears throat> education 1.0, like the first industrial revolution based on mechanical aspects, like using the blackboard, using the books, <coughs> which is it's also a technology. It's a very simple technology. It's a very um, easy to use technology. We can then go over to the Education 2.0, which is based on electricity. For instance, when using a slide projector, an overhead projector, it can be also with a computer, but if the computer is not connected, so we are in the basic uh, steps. 3.0 would be to use the internet, cloud computing, <coughs> digital tools in order to help to support education. Examples of this are using learning management systems where the teachers can put uh, educational resources. Another example is also the use of engagement apps like Padlet we have here, or Mentimeter, or Kahoot, or Quizzes, or Quizalize. There are so many things based on the cloud for interaction in the classroom or in hybrid contexts. 
or also the MOOCs. MOOCs belong to me in this Education 3.0. It's using the cloud basically to put three things, to put explanations in, 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 as videos, to put interactive quizzes, and to have forums for the conversation of students and questions to the professor. So these three things, videos, interactive web technologies and social networks based on the cloud is what <clears throat> in a way represents Education 3.0. So we have gone <coughs> in Education 1.0, where we are on the earth, where we are face to face, we are down in the earth to the cloud as a support for education in Education 3.0. Now, what is next? Next is Education 4.0, where rather than basing on the cloud, we are based on artificial intelligence. Maybe with some additional tools like mixed reality. <coughs> I'll take some water, excuse me. with some additional tools like mixed reality, like multimodal interaction, Internet of Things, and like uh, forums which, where both people and bots participate. So this is, to me, the context where we are. We have 1.0 mechanical, 2.0 electrical, 3.0 digital, connected cloud computing, and 4.0 artificial intelligence. Please note that each of these new technologies does not replace the ones before, but adds on the possibilities that are there. And the education, the, the knowledge, well, for instance, this would be you, you, some examples of where you can find knowledge. So in 1.0 would be in Encyclopedia Britannica or Espasa Calpe in Spain, so a collection of books. 2.0 would be digital or analog tools like Encarta, 3.0 would be looking things up on Google and 4.0 would be uh, making a question to ChatGPT. It's also interesting to note <coughs> that these different states of information match very nicely with the states of the matter. The matter can be solid, liquid, gas or plasma and this matches very well. 1.0, where the information is put on books, is like solid, everything is rigid, you cannot manipulate it. 2.0, <coughs> where the liquid can adapt to the form, but not the vo volume is the same, is like more adaptable. Digital resources can be adapted, very well. audiovisual resources can be adapted to different devices. 3.0, digital resources, are by default open because if they're not constrained they are spreading out so open education is like gas and the fourth one plasma is like computable education so this is the context now what does it really mean if we move from 3.0 to 4.0 in the context of MOOC production it's some more water <coughs> So let's look at the three main important things, the videos, the quizzes, and the forums. And how would, has it been done with Education 3.0, based on cloud computing? Well, <clears throat> let's start with videos. Thank you very much. My voice is so-so. Uh, so in order to produce videos, what would you do? Basically, I'm simplifying, of course. You have the pre-production of the videos where you have to think of the video concept, you have to write a script, you have to look for additional audiovisual resources to support your speech. Then you go to production, you go to the recording studio to do the shooting. And then there are some post-production phases with edition and subtitling. So these three main aspects right now are done 
like this. So the video concept, you think about the, what kind of video you're doing. Is it an interview? Is it a, 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 a screencast? What are the basic ideas you want to convey? What is the setting? What is the resources needed? You just have to think and decide. Then you write a script for each of the moments of the video, you write what is the background, the visual, and what do you say? So think again, write, thank you very much. Thank you. Then you have to look for additional resources, images, sounds. Maybe if your MOOC is really open, Creative Commons, you have to look for to, uh, content with the appropriate license, for instance, here in Pixabay for some images, etc. So this is the pre-production. Then you go to the recording studio with some personnel, some equipment, some teleprompter, or maybe you have to have use some equipment for screencasting. And then comes the post-production. Post-production is addition uh, of, of the video, the raw video, and maybe you have to work on sub subtitles. So this is how it has worked so far. Education 3.0, cloud-based computing. Now, how will this change if we put AI into the equation? We have the same phases, the pre-production, the production, and the post-production. But now, for instance, for preparing the concept of your video, you can ask ChatGPT, or you can use BART or Claude 2, etc. Give me some ideas on how to present this. For instance, here, you, you have to write the prompt ad adequately. You have been producing moves for many years now, and you're experiencing conveying information. Give me three examples of three ideas of how to introduce the topic of whatever uh, recursion program. And I get three ideas. And I can decide, OK, I like this one. Then for the script, I can ask as well. Give me a script with the different scenes, with the different backgrounds, with what I should say to explain this. And I can get some interesting ideas. Of course, it's very important to write the prompt very well in you know, order to good good results. Then for supporting uh, resources, rather than looking for open source images, you can just generate new images. Uh, this is here an image I created for explaining recursion based on mirrors. Uh, I use normally Bing to create images. You can ask three, uh, 100 queries a day and for which you get four uh, answers for each of the query. Or you can also improve existing uh, images. For instance, improve the resolution or extend images. This is the uh, famous painting by Vermeer of the lady with the pearl. And then you can extend it and you can uh, adapt it to the resolution and the size you need. <clears throat> and then you go to the production phase. I know, and more, more resources. You can generate new sounds with 11 laps or play HD. Could you could generate audio. You can ge generate music with AI to, as a background of your uh, video. And then you go to the production. Would you go then to a studio? Linea siete. Uh, sorry, Linea siete. Que These are some examples. Would you go to a studio? No. You can use tools like the idea or runway or synthesia to produce the video. You produce the text, the script, or maybe the AI has helped you in producing the script, and then a video with an avatar. It can be your own avatar, it can be a normal avatar, it can uh, speak it. And then maybe you have to edit, and maybe you have to produce some subtitles for which you can also use AI technology to get the script, the transcription of an AI uh, based uh, video. So I've made the example, I will not show it, uh, but uh, basically in half an hour, you go from the idea to the script, to the video with additional resources, with images, so that the efficiency of producing audiovisual content is much higher. Yeah. Next topic, quizzes. 
Before, you had to think, okay, what are my multiple choice questions? What are my quizzes? You have to think, now you can get help from AI, either using general purpose tools like ChatGPT or Cloud2 or Bart or Bing Chat, etc., or even use AI specialized applications for these tasks like Prepper AI or Quillens or Quizlet. Here, I've done the example, no? You are an experienced Java programming uh, professor, please create some questions. And maybe you have to tweak it a little bit. Maybe you don't like it, but you have a, a, a basis for very fastly uh, getting some examples. Here, I've done the same with BART, uh, quite different, but it's very inspirational. And you don't start with an empty uh, blank page. You have something maybe to adapt and to improve. And there are also other tools like Prep AI or Quiz Quillians or others that have evolved like Quizlet that has AI in order to produce and, and interesting quizzes. Third part, we have the content, the video, the quiz. The third part would be the forums. You can use tools. <coughs> For instance, the forum of edX or of Coursera, or can you use or you can use external tools like Edstem, Edstem, to run the forum of students. But what you can you also do in 4.0 is to add to these people participating in the forum a bot. This is, for instance, what David Malam from Harvard University is planned to do. He is done a test run in this summer and he will go to use it in the next academic year is to add to this EdSTEM forum an additional participant. He used to have this duck as a reference to students. Okay, you have to explain your programs to, your, to, a, to a plastic duck because it's good explaining to somebody. And, and now he uses the same metaphor as this duck, which is an AI based participant participated in the forum. Of course, you know that AI may not always give the right answer, but the students might not either. So it's a very uh, a participant like all the others were. So we will see more and more of this. Forums uh, where there are people and bots. There was a previous experiment done at, at, at Georgia Tech several years ago with some older technology, Watson from IBM, uh, that needed a lot of training. Now it, you don't need to train so much. The effort done at Georgia Tech to do, to train this Jill Watson, who was a, a bot, was tremendous. Now this is disappearing. You can use it much faster. And there are also specialized tools like Tutor Eva, et cetera. Our colleagues, we have some colleagues in Guatemala, at the Galileo, with whom we participate a lot. They have made this comparison. How much would it cost to do a module in the traditional way? The videos, the quizzes, the preparation of the forum, they said, well, it depends very much on many things. Let's say 12, 14 hours, the, the preparation, the shooting, the post-production, and how the same thing would take using AI tools like ChatGPT, like DALI, like uh, other tools I will mention later. And it's less than half of the time. Of course, you have to very nice adapt what you get, but the efficiency, the productivity is much higher. Let me give a concrete example, no? Or on, on, for instance, since I'm a, teaching, I teach programming, how it has evolved from the 2.0 to the 3.0 to the 4.0 era. 2.0, this is Edska Vibe Dijkstra, who used to write on paper. Uh, this is 2.0. There's no 1.0 because there were no computers before. In 3.0, this is what we do right now. We use integrated development environments to help the students or the programmer to develop their programs. And this environment knows about the syntax of the language and, and closes the parentheses and makes suggestions uh, for writing the program. And maybe you have to uh, 
if you have questions, you can go to forums like Stack Overflow, etc. This is where we are now. Where will we be? Where, what will we do? I, I teach first year programming in the next academic year. So we will use Eclipse, but we will use Eclipse and add an add on like Tab9, and there are many others, uh, which are basically AI code assistants, where you write a comment, for instance, like GitHub Copilot, you write a comment and then it produces a proposal for a method, a function of itself. So rather than write, using these syntax directed editors, we add to it AI assisted tools, assisting tools to program. And rather than having a forum with people, we can add some bots. So there are many coding assistants. It's incredible the number of these coding assistants that are appearing. They're not always right, but they have a good basis where you can program much faster. What can they do? They can do automatic fixing of errors, improved code completion, do refactoring. There are some others specialized in refactoring, code generation, coding suggestions and uh, help in more efficient uh, collaboration. Actually, right now, Stack Overflow as a forum for programmers to exchange uh, ideas and to pose questions is shrinking. For instance, in the month of March, 14% less participation, where at the same time, GitHub Copilot is increasing, is growing. Here are some uh, uh, images. How really programming is changing today and about the forum let me <coughs> explain a bit more about this ai that can participate in forums where they can explain this is from david malan explain highlighted lines of code improve the code explain error messages help students to find bugs this, uh, assess the design of student programs provide feedback etc not always right you know that but it's interesting uh, evolution. So this is the evolution from hand coding to syntax directed editors to generative AI code assistance. And for forums, from personal interaction to online forums to mixed home and bot forums. So this is basically the summary of the second part. We've gone for, from the 3.0 digital era where it was cumbersome to make a video, lots of, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to some other AI based tools where it's much faster, much more efficient, it's much easier to change things, etc. Of course, there's always some um, beware you have to be things that you have to be, be aware of. You have to be aware of hallucinations, AI may hallucinate. Some of the nuances of what is there it might not be appear uh, good for you, so you have to be always critical. Critical thinking is the most important uh, skill today uh, in order to really appreciate what is has been presented to you and adapt it. And of course, the appearance of this new possibility does not mean total replacement. You can still do things the old way, but there are some additional ways, maybe in some of the videos, some of the quizzes, you uh, use these tools. So this is doing the same with new tools. But what about new possibilities? What will be the next generation MOOCs in my uh, uh, idea? So rather than just doing the same as before, more efficiently, you can do things that were not possible before. You can do richer, better things which are more personalized. For instance, before, I mean, students or people in general, citizens, don't normally look at videos at the normal speed. No, they go twice. The time is, uh, we want to go to the, what, where's the important things? Forget about all the things around it. And so people used to look at it uh, in twice the speed, etc. cetera, not the speed watchers. Right now, you can summarize. I do it myself. I, there's a very nice video from Salman Khan explaining uh, what I will uh, talk about later on. And okay, rather than having a 15 minute video, let's 
run it through the summarizer. What are the main aspects? Okay, and then I can go to one particular point and look at it. So this summarizing possibilities of generative AI is useful to, uh, to speed up things. There are many tools for video summarizing, for instance, Merlin and many others. No, this is, this is the video by Salman Khan. He talks of master, uh, mastery learning, etc. And these are the important aspects with the time, time points, uh, the important messages that are automatically got from the video. And then I can go to this particular point. What about video translation? Now it becomes easy. Not only subtitle translation, also dubbing, also lip syncing to the particular language, also can express emotions, can clone your voice, and there are many different tools. What about video personalization? There's a tool called GAN AI that starting from one video, Hi, Linda. You can get as many videos as you want. Hi, Michael. Hi, Tutipon. Hi, whoever. Speaking and moving the lips just as it's needed. It is personalized for each individual person. So this video personalization was not possible before. You can address now a particular speaker personally with the name or with the location or some other aspects. What is this possible? It's possible, and I will talk about it in, in a minute in more detail, what Khan Academy has announced the same day GPT, a GPT-4 was announced, Khan announced this Socratic tutor, a tutor for the Khan Academy platform that helps the students in learning. And, would, and if the student asked, give me the result of this question, it would not give, would not give the answer. It would give, no, think about this, how a Socrates do, in the same way a Socrates do, would, would do. Okay, I will not give the result. You have to think. Think about this. What would you do? What, think about it. Learn. This is very interesting. We will see, I mean, it's still probably um, very early times, but we will see how this evolves and how a, a student can help an assistant, a tutor, a personalized tutor to help in each of the things. Then another idea. There are many meeting assistants. I don't know whether you have used these meeting assistants. Yeah, there are several, there are probably many more. What are these meeting assistants? You have a Zoom uh, <coughs> um, meeting, you have a Google Meet or Teams meeting. Uh, they can summarize, it can summarize, it can transcribe, it can write meeting notes, it can uh, identify the key points, the key actions. It can identify speakers by voice. It can also do sentiment analysis. Very interesting. Conversation analytics, etc. These tools, could they be used in forums? I think it's very, very valuable in order to have summary of forum conversations, in order to search for them, and even to do recommendation for each of the students. You don't understand this. Go to this forum where this discussion is going on. Now we have the ability with AI, it's a master of language, and we can make recommendations to the students. Or we can make debates, debates with bots and persons, like Khan Academy promises. Of course, you can have, and we have seen it before, <coughs> support for authors and instructors. We have seen no, how to do videos, quizzes, support resources, etc. But it can also help the instructor and the author to generate slides, glossaries, summaries, and more. What else? Course discovery for learners. You know that ChatGPT has these plugins, which are the ears and the eyes of ChatGPT, so that it is contacted to, to some other tools. No? So edX, for instance, has provided such a plugin in order to discover courses. And what does this mean, this evolution, what does it mean? On the one hand, that the platforms, as we know them, are evolving. And on the other hand, that new platforms are coming out. What are the platforms we know edX, Coursera are doing? Here are some of the things they have done 
and that they have planned for the coming months. As I mentioned, this ChatGPT plugin for X is an easy thing for content discovery. Also viral sharing, a student is looking at a video and want to share it on their social network, they can do this easily. And it can enhance the learning experience. Summary, we have see, seen it. Translations, to they are not translating to many languages. The problem is, how do you know if the translation is correct? So this is not an issue, this is an important issue. <coughs> <coughs> a learner help center <coughs> and then gray things that are promised a career coach a learning assistant this is all uh, plans and for teacher experience as a co-pilot for authors and instructors this is what edx has done in black and in gray what will come out in the coming months also coursera is very active there you can do in search search in videos in readings and other resources again Translation, machine generated translations of subtitles into many languages. Language is not the problem anymore. Support for screen readers, keyboard navigation. And the interesting thing is the one below for the learning, real time personalization, recommendation for courses, weekly email digest for self reflection, goal setting, and planning for the week ahead. So it's very personalized for each of the students, depending on their performance, to what to do next and what to recommend next and also forum recommendations. Also, as I mentioned, Khan Academy is embracing GPT-4 from the very beginning, having this Socratic tutor and allowing the possibility for debates. And another tool, which also on the same day announced uh, AI support was Duolingo. Luis von Ahn, a Guatemaltecan of German origin who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon, uh, has developed Max, an AI-based tutor to help explaining answers, to play different roles, and to help learning better. So this is how platforms are evolving. But also, new platforms are coming out. And I'll mention speci specifically one which is called Knowledge, N-O-L-E-J, Knowledge, Knowledge. What does it do? You give it a video, you give it a blog post, and it generates automatically a number of resources. So you make information into a learning course. So it generates for you assessments, flashcards, quizzes, games, crosswords, on the basis on the content that is in the video or the blog post. Drag the words, summarize, glossaries, like magic you give it a video and you get some uh, educational content package well as an interactive video in the interactive book so i'm sure that in the new future new platforms new developments will come up that really embrace the possibilities of ai in order to produce educational content and there's some others I mentioned another one which is mini coins generator which is based on the card structure it also uses and AI assistant. Okay, I have the impression that now teachers will have to change the role. This is an image from a Spanish newspaper when some accidents were have took place with planes, where they said that pilots, rather than being aviators, so having full control of the planes, they are system managers. I think in a way, professors have to be also like system managers rather than, than lecturers. We have to construct the content and then be more coaches rather than the lecturers before. So let me come to, up to some conclusion and some recommendations, some final thoughts. We have seen in the first part how I see the evolution of technology, these four revolutions, and that AI era is different to the digital era, where the content, it can be more manipulatable, can be more computable, can be changeable. Then I've presented how MOOC production has become, or will become more efficient from recording in the studio to producing videos with AI. Of course, the video production is still not perfect. But do you know how fast this is evolving? I will show you two videos, which are only 
three or oh, three and a half months apart, four months. This is video produced from text. You know, give me a party where some people are partying and have drinking beer. Of course, it does not make sense, some of these, these things, you know. It, it, it's, it's still, well, it's still not bad, but look at this, how, how they're drinking the beer, etc. So 100 days later, video production, automatic video from text to video has improved so much. So put another 100 days, put a year. So we will see an exponential improvement on video production, on quiz production, on help in, in forums. So in the, on the one hand, you can now do different things. You personalize your content much to each individual person. And the platforms, we know edX, Coursera, Khan, Duolingo are evolving, embracing these possibilities, whereas others are coming up, like knowledge. So I think we will see a renaissance of MOOC production and deployment, where for production, there will be a teacher co-pilot that help you, help you, not, not impose. It, it's just suggestions, because there can be a lot of mistakes, to do things more efficiently. And for deployment, we'll have a support for the student as a Socratic tutor, as a participant in forums and debate, and in personalized reinforcement learning. And this is just the beginning. Don't judge JNI by the forums today. There's still problems. But the investment is so high. GPT-5 GPT will come out probably at the beginning of 2025. So it's some time to go, but it will be much better. Or, or Google has announced Gemini, which will uh, be multi-model AI with text, video, images, audio, etc., all together. So, which will be <coughs> a, a quantum uh, step forward. And some of the initiatives are not open to the general public. They're not free, like Vertex, which is more for companies, but they exist and they provide the possibilities. I was recently in two events, one by Microsoft and one by Google, which was for, for companies. All the customer support in the future will be done by AI. There will be maybe people overlooking the whole system, but if you complain about something, you will get a response by AI. Not, not, there's no somebody writing it. So the, acti the acti activity is tremendous now around AI. The investment is huge. Here are some figures. It's trillion dollars in the coming years, and the returns are expected to be also huge. Probably there will be a bubble, like the dot-com bubble we had in, in the year 2000, or the railway mania that was in Britain in, in 1840s. So uh, over expectation and, and, and then going down, but something will remain. In conclusion, there are still many open issues, many problems, like intellectual property of images, quality of result, biases, uh, the impact on different industry, so that the regulation is needed. Like there were with other revolutions here, the train, you know, people against the train because it can be a lot of problems. Or with the internet, there's still a lot of problems, like fake news and, and spam, etc. But nevertheless, I think it's something to analyze, to understand, and to use in the most possible ways. Just a final thought, AI may help you extraordinarily, so use it, but at the same time, consider that it can hallucinate, it can give you wrong answers. So it's important always to be in control. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor Kalas, for the very insightful and also foresight to the future of what could, uh, we could um, expect for the future. Um, I think now it is the time for the floor. If you have questions that you would like to ask directly to Professor Kalas. Yes. Hi, <clears throat> thank you so much, Carlos. I enjoyed really your presentation. Uh, so basically, I have maybe a question slash a comment. Uh, my question is, okay, what has been done or is being done is very interesting, 
But from my perspective, I think MOOCs and their beauty and at the same time their nightmare is diversity because they are open to thousands of people. They could be from different regions and backgrounds. And here we are talking about culture, right? And if we're talking about like this, I think we should shift the focus from simply content to other things because like for the successful like adoption of a given like technology or tool i think it's a whole ecosystem right and i will also work on open educational resources and it's always the same problem so basically we are like focusing mainly on the content based things and it's good it's very important in education but i think we need to shift the focus a little bit to the instructional strategies and approaches and i was very impressed by the khan like khan academy like that uh, tool or candidate tutor that was like presented yeah and i think we need more like this because content production is good but i don't think that's enough and that's why we see like retention rate is very high is very low in, in MOOCs specifically and that's why i think it's time like to think in a holistic ecosystem from the design in terms for instance using game elements and everything from the instructional approach in terms of which like maybe one one if you are talking about personalized learning and these things and also of course like content and all these things so that's like maybe my my thinking i think it's time to shift the focus from content based to practice based so yeah this is my thinking and thank you so much thank you very much uh, ahmed uh, i Sorry. totally agree with you but content production is expensive or was expensive now it can be cheaper and can be more personalizable so adapting to different uh, regions to different needs to different individuals uh, personally so i think this opens very interesting venues to look into the future yes i agree with you thank you okay um, we still have maybe we can still receive one question or uh, uh, Shan will show the padlet <coughs> from there online too good morning yes um first of all i would like to express my impressions yes i have learned a lot from these presentations and i really uh, i can see the value what you have the very good collections of the ais and the tools and explain from the histories and also as mentioned foresight for the futures i would like to know that based on your experience which is have a very high value in terms of the education aspect, what should be the theory that we should uh, extend and also use is based on uh, our, our AI era today to make sure that we will enhance education and fit to our student, yes. Yes, I, I recommend that you look at the video by, by Salman Khan uh, which was presented uh, in March, uh, where he presented this uh, Socratic tutor, uh, which is uh, developed by the, for the Khan Academy platform. Uh, he started his um, conversation or his, his presentation uh, by talking about mastery learning. Mastery learning, uh, the importance of uh, 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 grasping well a topic before going to the next one. And he talked about also Benjamin Bloom's uh, paper, famous paper, where he presents master learning in, on one side and, and what is efficiently done, which is one teacher to 100 students. So, so and a good number of students, which is not personalized. No? And what he said basically is that now AI technology allows us much better to go for this dream in an efficient way of mastery learning. So I think uh, this is, would be my response as well. No? So technology allows us to much more focus on each of the students and uh, the inefficiencies that um, were before can be now much, very much improved with AI technology. So I, my response would be uh, personalized uh, teaching uh, thanks to uh, AI tutoring.
Okay, um, we still have a couple of time. Actually, we do have time until 9.45, so there will be one more question <coughs> from there too. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. So thank you very much for the time, and it's a very interesting and exciting uh, uh, presentation, which I have learned a lot. So uh, my name is Han Yiqiu. I'm from the Hangzhou City University. But some of you may have missed my name yesterday. Well, I, I think we have all of us sitting here, a uh, big fan of technology driven learning and teaching, but we still have a lot of people outside this box. And you know, a lot of universities and colleges conducting learning and teaching through the traditional ways. So I'm just always puzzled and struggled every day on how the conflicts, how do we ease this conference. I know everyone knows the importance of technology supported learning and teaching through MOOCs, for example. I've been on this, uh, I'm a big fan of MOOCs. I've been on this probably for 10 years, started creating the micro master, now the micro credentials by working for a few universities. Well, the biggest challenge I have been confronted every day is how much do you want to replace the traditional learning and teaching courses, and how do you convince the administrators and the regulators, where should we move? Where are we going? Are you going to replace our jobs? Are you going to sort of you know, challenge in the traditional way of teaching? How much can we replace? The, like I was talking about probably 50-50, and the university will say, no, 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 you, you probably can do 30. So all these issues, I'm sure all of us here today are very interested in knowing how do we, you know, make a good balance and allow these changes more sort of uh, evolutionary rather than revolutionary. So I would like to very much hearing from you and others on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting question. I think the response might depend very much on the region and the regulation in each of the different countries on, on each of the resources. But let me give you my example. No? I teach a, a programming class in a face-to-face -face university where we have classes, regular classes, everything's face-to-face. -face. But at the same time, so we have the normal schedule with personal interaction, etc. But they say, I've made a MOOC, a MOOC on edX, on Java programming, and I use content from this MOOC as a complement to my class. It's, it's, it's in a locally uh, instance of open edX that we have for our students. And um, uh, we select the topics according for each week, which are the topics, and we call it the SPOC, a small private online course, because it's, it's restricted. But with the same content that I'm explaining, every week to the students. So this is a complement. They can learn in advance, they can repeat, they can see things, which I think is the attitude we should have, not of replacement, but of complementing, of blending. And now what is the percentage? This depends very much regionally. But I think the idea, as I said also before, new possibilities that not replace the previous one, but just complement them. And I think this is the most valuable thing, to use technology, uh, to complement, to reinforce, to help the learning, even if you teach face to face. And maybe some things you can replace a little bit or some advanced topics you can put only online or whatever. So you have to find out what is right balance. But I think blending, complementing both face to face and online and also uh, teacher uh, driven and AI driven this is another possible blending. I think for me, blending hybrid is the future and to find the right uh, fine tuning, this depends very much on the local considerations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we do have more questions, of yeah. course, from the online too. <coughs> yes, uh, this is a padlet and uh, thank you for sharing photos. Um, feel free to share photos. And for questions, we do have a few questions start from, okay, what are the barriers in using AI for MOOC creation? Would you really trust AI that much? How about the cost involved? Do you have any thought on that, sir? Yeah, I mean, you have, you should not trust AI. You should always be critical on what you see. You should not blindly take what is given. I think this is one thing. You have to be in control. This is just a suggestion. 
this is, as I said, rather than starting with a bl blank page, a white page, there's some suggestions, and you should decide. You should put your personal view on things. So you should not trust, you should understand it as a help. And the cost, well, uh, there are many free tools. Some, some are freemium. Some are, if you don't use it very much, then it's free, and if you want more, you have to pay. No? This is like with always uh, uh, all internet applications. No? So it depends very much on what you want, depend on, on the quality of what you want to have. Uh, but the freemium model is, is the one which is, I think, mostly used. Thank you so much. And then, next one, what's a MOOC actually about in your perception? Please suggestion the preparation way how to start and apply it in organization, country, etc. What is a MOOC in your perception? Well, <clears throat> I think Tabal Shah said it before, no? Uh, uh, MOOC platforms, I'm not using the, the MOOC word anymore. Let's talk about online education. Let, let talks about technology supported uh, uh, learning. Um, I think you can start, you should start small, no? Do some videos, do some interactive quizzes, etc. Uh, experiment, try to get comfortable and then get bigger and bigger. Uh, sometimes uh, it's good to have in the organization um, some initiatives at my university uh, as a vice rector. I had many uh, calls for the professors to propose MOOCs and there were some incentives from producing some money incentives, some support resources incentives to do these MOOCs and this helped us to go faster into the MOOC uh, development. You know? But if these incentives are not there, I think experimenting, trying out, seeing the possibilities is a good way to go. Okay, um, I think <coughs> we learned a lot from his talk. We can see that AI could be a good assistant, but we shall not never trust AI. Okay, so you can see with me, although he has a sore throat, but he kindly continue until the end. So this is such a courage. So thank you so much, Professor Carlos. Thank Please give much. him a big hand. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much.